Welcome to a short lecture on frameworks for understanding culture and language. This lecture is part of the data collection process for my PhD. Uh, once you've watched this lecture, you'll be asked to complete some tasks along with the other participants in the data collection process. Thanks very much for watching and listening. In the lecture, I'm going to walk you through a series of frameworks that help us really understand culture at different levels and also the interaction between culture and language at different levels. So I'm going to start with the tourist definition of culture, and then we'll move on to the iceberg analogy and the onion analogy. We'll take a look at some of the cultural values continuums that have been developed. We'll look at the learning domains of culture, which talks about how we really learn about culture and acquire a new culture. We'll take a look at communicative competence, which starts to link language and culture. And we'll look at intercultural competence, which is how we can function effectively in a, in a different culture. Then we'll take a look at intercultural communicative competence, which puts the two previous concepts together. And finally, we'll look at uh, a new theory called dynamic systems theory. Well, it's not new, but its application to culture is new. So that's what we're going to take a look at. I've put these different frameworks for culture and language in the order they're in for a very specific reason, and that is we're moving from simple frameworks to more complex frameworks. So the initial frameworks that we look at are admittedly the simpler frameworks, so the tourist definition and the iceberg analogy and so on, and then moving all the way up to the most complex frameworks. These are intercultural communicative competence and dynamic systems theory. Just because a framework is either simple or complex doesn't mean it's more or less valuable. The simple frameworks are really useful because they are very clear and because they're simple. So they're very easy to apply and they're really good as analysis tools. The more complex frameworks, on the other hand, really help us understand that culture and its interaction with language is a very complex idea or complex concept. So the, the more complex frameworks acknowledge that complexity, so to speak. So we'll take we'll start with the simpler frameworks and move to the more complex, but on the understanding that all of these frameworks are valuable in our overall understanding of culture and its interaction with language. So the tourist definition is admittedly the simplest of all of these frameworks of culture, but it's really valuable because this is the the conceptualization that everyday people have of what culture is. So all of our students and our teachers and everyone we interact with when we're interacting with a different cultural group, um, this is the understanding that they start with when it comes to culture. And it's called the tourist definition for a reason. Um, this is The tourist definition captures all of the, the pieces of culture that we actually travel um, to other cultures and other countries to experience. So as tourists, this is what we're looking for when we engage in tourism. So we might go to another culture to look at its art or its architecture. Uh, we might go to a different culture to experience its music. Um, we'll go to a different culture to look at all of the monuments that celebrate the history or the important historical events of that culture. This could be statues, it could be monoliths, it could be um, entire buildings. So any um, architectural or sculptural pieces that are made to celebrate that culture's um, important moments in time. We go to cultures to see that. A, a big one is we go to different cultures to experience their festivals. Um, when I was uh, traveling around Japan, I used to like to go to the, the summer festivals that they had, and this was a really uh, cool experience. Um, so the festivals, whether they be arts festivals or food or uh, food festivals or music festivals, they offer a really um, interesting and exciting window into a culture. And we obviously go to different cultures to try different food. Um, that's a huge draw. So we might go to Spain to try Spanish food. We might go to France to try French food or China to ch try Chinese food and so on. We also notice when we're in a different culture what types of clothing people are wearing. So we might not exactly want to try on that clothing, but we do take note of what people are wearing, what the traditional costumes are versus the everyday clothing and so on. And language is also part of this tourist definition of culture. It's, it's a piece of the overall culture that we might go to another uh, country to experience. So we might go to um, Brazil to learn Portuguese, or we might go to Colombia to learn Spanish. Uh, we might go to Japan to learn Japanese and so on. So language is one piece of what we go to another country to experience when we're looking for a new cultural and linguistic experience.
So that's the tourist definition of culture. And as I said, this one's really important because it is very simple. And this is the definition that we all start with as a base when it comes to looking at what culture is. So new students coming into our schools, this is their perception of what culture is. So they might want to you know, learn English in order to travel to an English speaking country in order to experience these different touristy things. So that is what the tourist definition is. Still on the simple side of definitions, but moving towards the more complex, we have the next definition or framework, the iceberg analogy. So the iceberg analogy basically says that culture is like an iceberg. And an iceberg has a portion of it above the water, but it has a much larger portion of it below the water. So the portion of the iceberg that's above the water, this is what we see. So it's called the seen part of a culture, or the in awareness part of a culture, or the surface part of a culture. Then underneath the water is this larger piece of the iceberg. It's called the unseen culture, the out of awareness culture, or the deep culture, depending on which um, person's definition you use. And I always like to um, kind of make a joke, but it's very true. It wasn't it wasn't the top part of the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Okay, the Titanic didn't hit the top part of the iceberg. The Titanic hit the bottom part of the iceberg. So whenever it comes to culture, if we run into challenges, it's usually not the top part of the iceberg that creates those challenges because we can see them and we can adapt to them. It's the bottom part of the iceberg that creates the challenges. And these are the parts that will sink the Titanic, so to speak, with us being the Titanic. Um, because we're just not aware of them, we don't see them. I used to call the bottom part of the iceberg the invisible walls. So I, I'd be going merrily along in another culture and then I would just like wham, come up against this invisible wall. And I had no idea what it was I had hit. and it would often take a long time to figure out or understand what that wall was that I hit. So that unseen part of an iceberg is the really challenging part when it comes to using this, uh, this iceberg analogy for culture. So what are some examples of seen parts of culture? So the seen parts of a culture are actually all the pieces we just covered in the tourist definition. So this is the food, the clothing, the art, the music, and the language, seen and heard, I guess we should say. Um, so all the pieces that we can pick up with our five senses. Okay, That's the seen part. So it's not always easy to deal with the seen part, but we can manage it because we can see it. So what lies underneath? What, what are the, what's the underneath part of this iceberg culture? Well, underneath we have things like values and assumptions and beliefs and ideas that really drive a culture. So I'll give you an example of, of one of the invisible walls that I hit with one of my jobs. I was a manager in Japan and um, I was tasked with giving um, school managers uh, feedback on their performance. And, you know, me being me and thinking I was being a good manager, I, I gave them uh, positive feedback. I said, oh, you're doing a great job and, you know, we're really pleased with your performance and blah, blah, blah. Then I got my, I got into trouble with my boss because um, my boss said, you'd never, never, never tell managers that they're doing a good job. And I'm like, what is going on? Why would I not tell someone they're doing a good job? Well, she and culturally um, in Japan, the idea is that you don't tell someone they're doing a good job because you want you don't want them to get complacent. You want them to kind of stay on their toes and and feel they have to keep improving and keep trying and keep fighting. And if you tell them they're doing a good job, then you take some of that fight out of them. So this was one of an example of one of the invisible walls that I ran into, and that is part of the unseen part of the iceberg uh, that is culture. So hopefully that makes this seen and unseen piece different, or sorry, seen and unseen piece clear for you. So that's the iceberg analogy. There's parts of a culture we can see, and there's parts of a culture that we can't see, and the part that we can't see is the part that's most likely to trip us up. Adding a little bit more complexity to our framework of, of culture is the onion analogy. So our iceberg analogy kind of had two layers to culture, the seen piece and the unseen piece. 
the onion analogy adds a third layer. So if we think of culture as an onion, and you know you take an onion and you can peel the layers back. So if we look at culture as an onion, the, the layer on the top, the piece that we can see right away, are what we call the products of a culture. So this, once again, is our tourist definition stuff. This is uh, the stuff that we can see. It's our art, our music, our food, our language, our clothing, our buildings, and so on. These are all the things that a culture produces or the people of a culture produce. Then if we peel that layer back, underneath we have the next layer, which are the behaviors. So the behaviors are what we do or what people in a culture do in a particular situation. So for example, um, when people meet each other in most, most North American cultures, they shake hands. Um, when people meet each other in Japan, they will bow. Um, in Europe, it tends to be a kiss, uh, kind of a fake kiss on one side of the cheek, and, and then maybe it's two kisses, one on each side. So behaviors are how we behave in specific situations. And this is, these are situations that occur all the time. So, for example, when we greet each other, when we sit down and have a meal, uh, when we want to argue with someone, how do we behave? Um, when we're dating someone, how do we behave? When we get married, how do we behave? And so on. So this is everything from rituals and traditions all the way, up, all the way down to just everyday behavior. What do we do in specific situations? Then we're going to peel back that layer and right in the core of the onion, we get the ideas of the un of the culture. So these are things like beliefs and values and assumptions that really form the essence of the culture and they form what makes that culture very, very different. And it, it's interesting that the ideas are at the core of an onion because the ideas are what drive a culture. So we often think that the, the things we see, the products are really what a culture is, but it's not. The, the essence of any culture really comes from that, that idea's core of the culture. And I'll give you an example of this. A lot of people often can't understand what Canadian culture is, and particularly how it differs from American culture. So Canadian culture, in Canadian culture, we have a few products um, that are unique. We have things like maple syrup, we have toques, we have ice hockey and sledding and igloos and things like that. Um, but most of the products that we see on a daily basis in Canada really are not that different from what we might see in the United States or what we might see in the UK, for example. So if we peel it back, do we see at the behaviors layer, do we see anything different about Canadian culture? Well, we tend to behave fairly similar to um, the people south of the border. There doesn't tend to be a lot of difference in terms of how we behave. We still shake hands when we meet people. Um, you know, our weddings tend to be very similar and our meals tend to be this fairly similar. So even at the behaviors level, we really don't see a lot of uniqueness when it comes to Canadian culture. But where we really do see the essence of what Canadian culture is, is, is at the ideas level. There are there's a very different set of assumptions that drive Canadian culture and that have driven Canadian culture uh, basically since its inception. And it's really at the ideas level that Canada or Canadian culture becomes quite different from American culture versus UK culture and so on. So it really is at the ideas level that Canadian culture is unique. The challenge is, is that people coming into the culture, they don't see the ideas uh, first. They see the products and the behaviors first. And so people coming into Canadian culture are like, well, it's no different than American culture or British culture and so on. So what are these unique ideas at the core of Canadian culture? Well, there's a great researcher. He's a socioeconomic researcher, Michael Adams. He runs an organization called Enveronics. And he's done a series of studies to try to pull apart what Canadian culture is versus American culture. And he came up with this, this triangulation of ideas that form the essence of Canadian culture at the ideas level. And this is, um, first of all, a belief in the rule of law. So Canadians uh, believe that the law trumps everything and everyone needs to be treated exactly the same under the law. So if there's a rule, Canadians generally follow it. Obviously there's exceptions, but the belief in Canada, in Canada is that you have to follow the law. Then another piece to Canadian culture is the idea of tolerance. So there's um, a tolerance for diversity for things different. So Canadians like don't mind that if someone has different clothing or speaks a different language or eats different food. 
um, or has a different religion. There's just this overall tolerance for difference and tolerance for diversity. Then the third piece um, of this triangle of Canadian values is a belief in equality. So everyone's the same. So you're the same regardless of your gender, your gender preference, your gender identity, your religion, the color of your skin, your height, your wealth, and so on. So part of this triangle of ideas that um, Canada is founded on is this idea of equality. So it's this, these three ideas forming the core of Canadian culture that really distinguish it from American culture and UK culture. So this, an analysis of Canadian culture really helps us to see the power of the onion analogy because Canadian culture doesn't appear distinct at the product or behaviors level, but it is very distinct at the ideas level. And it's only, an, it's only when we get to that ideas level that we see what Canadian culture really is. So that's the onion analogy. So once again, it's fairly simple, but we're starting to add a little bit more complexity. And, but it's still a very powerful tool for analysis of a culture. Because that ideas piece of a culture, that core of the onion part, is so important to what a culture actually is and how it functions, uh, researchers have done a lot of work digging into that whole ideas piece. And one of the best pieces of research to come out of this is comes from Geert Hofsted, um, or Hofstede. Sorry, I'm not very good at my uh, Dutch pronunciation there. Um, and what he did is he identified key values on which cultures differ. And how he did this was that he initially looked at um, country head offices for the multinational organization IBM. And so he held that the IBM cultural piece should be the same from country to country, but then layered onto that there should be these cultural differences or cultural values differences um, in terms of how each country itself or each culture itself was operating. And so with this analysis of these different IBM country offices, he was able to pull out cultural values continuums. And what these are is, um, so a con they're continuum. So on one end, there's one concept, and on the other end, there's the opposing concept. And his idea is that um, cultures fit anywhere on that continuum between these two polar opposite values or ideas. And through his research, he started to pull out the values or ideas that were most important in terms of defining what a culture is at the values or ideas level. So we'll take a look at some of these so you can start to get your head around them and you can start to see how these are really good analysis frameworks. So uh, the first one of the cultural values continuums that he came up with is one called high context versus low context. So on one end you have high context cultures and on the other end you have low context cultures. So high context cultures are cultures in which everything around a message is very, very important. So if I say something very simple to you, for example, thank you, um, in a high context culture, the listener is going to consider all of the information around my words. So they're going to consider our relationship, they're going to consider the situation we're in, they're going to consider um, how long we've known each other, and they're going to consider all of these things outside of just the words that I say. So all of the contextual information um, of the context in which we're communicating is actually much more important than the message that I say. So uh, high context cultures tend to be fairly homogenous cultures where um, everyone has the same set of assumptions and the same values uh, when they're communicating. Uh, a classic example of a high context culture is Japan. It is a very homogenous culture and all of the information around communication situations it carries a lot more meaning than the words you actually say in that context. At the opposite end of this, we have low context cultures. And in these cultures, what we say when we communicate is usually what we mean. So all of the information around that really doesn't hold any importance. So um, if I say thank you, I truly mean thank you. I don't mean something else because of our relationship or because of the situation. I truly mean the words that I say. Low context cultures tend to be less homogenous because people in those cultures can't take quite as much for granted. They can't um, take the uh, a common set of assumptions for granted. So Canada, it tends to be a fairly low context culture because we are not that homogenous when it comes to our cultural backgrounds. So that was one of the cultural continuums that Hofstede came up with. 
Um, another one that he came up with is called power distance. So on one side we have high power distance and on the other side we have low power distance. So a power, power distance is a value that kind of talks about how comfortable we are um, demonstrating that we've got a lot of power or a lot of authority. So in a high power distance culture, um, people with a lot of power and a lot of authority are very comfortable demonstrating that they have that authority and they're allowed to. So for example, they're allowed to um, have flashy cars and big houses and they'll, uh, they might use uniforms to show their ranking in the hierarchy. Um, they also can get away with treating people with less power um, uh, less respectfully. So in, in a workplace, for example, someone with a lot of power might be allowed to yell at their employees or, or demean their employees, uh, make their employees cry or use their employees however they want, basically. So that's a high power distance culture. And then on the other s scale uh, side of this is the low power distance cultures. And these are cultures where it's not really acceptable to demonstrate that you've got power or that you've got authority. So it's not acceptable to have the really flashy cars or, you know, to wear uniforms that show your rank or um, to emphasize that you've got a big house and all of this money. But the real key here with low power distance is in the workplace, it's not acceptable to um, treat people with less power any differently than you would treat other people. So you're not allowed to yell at your employees, you're not allowed to treat them disrespectfully, you can't use them or abuse them or do anything like that. So in a low power distance culture, if you were to go into the workplace, it's actually very difficult to tell who the managers are because everyone's treating each other the same way. Whereas in a high power distance culture, it's very easy to tell who the, who the managers are because they're being treated in a very different way. So that's a good way to think about this continuum. So that's high power distance and low power distance. And the final one on this slide is individualism versus collectivism. And this one's pretty self-explanatory. There are cultures in which the individual is deemed the most important entity. So um, individuals make decisions based on what's best for them. Okay. And on the other side is collectivism or a group oriented culture where people make decisions based on what's best for the group. So the good of the group is put ahead of the good of the individual. Um, so you've got kind of individualism or individual thinking versus group thinking. That's another values continuum that we often that that defines or differentiates cultures. Another cultural values continuum is one that's called masculine uh, versus feminine. This does not mean men versus women. Um, I really don't like the labeling of this one, but um, it, it captures a, two sets of values that are often associated with men versus women, but not always. So um, another way to define this one might be competitive versus collaborative. But anyway, it's called masculine versus feminine. So we just have to live with that. Um, so a masculine culture is a very competitive culture. And this is a culture in which everyone's always trying to get ahead at the expense of someone else. So um, it's all about me, but it's all about me getting ahead. So we're very competitive. Um, the end justifies the means. I'll do whatever it takes to get ahead. I'll step on whoever I need to step on in order to get ahead. A feminine culture, on the other stand, is a very collaborative culture. Um, in this type of culture, it's it people help each other it's all about helping someone rather than stepping on someone so you know i'm going to take time to help you as a colleague or as a friend as opposed to stepping on you in order to get ahead so i want what's best for you as much as i want what's best for me this is slightly different than individual versus group because it, it really captures this uh, dog eat dog on the masculine side versus this helping idea on the feminine side so it's high, highly competitive on one side versus um, very much a helping oriented um, value on the other side, on the feminine side. The next uh, values continuum that we've got here is called uncertainty avoidance. So on one side we've got high uncertainty avoidance and on the other side we've got low uncertainty avoidance. So uncertainty avoidance is all about how, how comfortable people in a culture are with risk. So if people in a culture are not comfortable with risk, they'll do anything possible to avoid risk. So this is a high uncertainty avoidance culture. They don't like risk and they do whatever necessary to avoid risk. People in this culture will do a lot of planning and they'll do more planning and more planning. Um, they'll do a lot of risk assessment and they'll just be very, very careful before they take action or before they make decisions. 
On the other hand, low uncertainty avoidance cultures, the people in these cultures are very comfortable with risk and they're comfortable with uncertainty. So they, they will do far less planning and they will be more spontaneous. Um, they won't take quite as long to make decisions. Their decision making process just will be less methodical and just more spur of the moment. So that's high uncertainty avoidance versus low uncertainty avoidance. It really captures the idea of how comfortable people in a culture are with risk. And the final values continuing on this slide is uh, short-term orientation versus long-term orientation. This, this values continuum captures how far forward or back in time people look in a culture. So a short-term orientation culture, um, in this type of culture, people really don't look very far ahead or very far back. Um, when they're doing their planning or when they're just looking at life and making decisions. So they, they live very much in the present. So short-term orient orientation cultures are very present-oriented cultures. They don't think about the future. It's kind of, you know, the future will, will either happen or it won't happen, but what's most important is the now. Long-term orientation cultures, on the other hand, look either very far in the future or very far back in time when they're looking at their decisions and how they operate. So people in a long-term orientation culture that's future-oriented, these people will do a lot of planning. They'll have their five-year plan and their 10-year plan, and they'll save money because they might need that money tomorrow. So they're just very future-oriented. And they also believe that the future will be better. So they, they always think, okay, now's not so good, but you know what? The future is going to be better. Okay? You can also have long-term orientation going into the past. And in this type of culture, um, these, these are cultures with very, very long histories and very rich histories who value those histories. So they're going to always look to the past or look to their history in terms of their decision making today. So they really value that richness of their long history. So that is short term orientation versus long term orientation. Short term orientation, the focus is on the present. Long term orientation, the focus is either on the future, very far out, or the past, very far back. We'll just take a look at three more cultural values continuums because these values continuums are just a really rich uh, framework from which to analyze that core piece of a culture and really get our heads around what's happening deep down in that culture. So another values continuum is universalism versus particularism. Now universalism means that people in the culture believe that everyone should be treated exactly the same way. So this is a belief in equality. So it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, how tall you are, how beautiful you are, what color your skin is. All of the rules apply to all of the people. So that's universalism. Everyone gets treated the same way. Particularism, on the other hand, means that each person gets treated depending on who he or she is. So um, you might get treated a different way if you're part of the family versus if you're an outsider. You might get treated a particular way if you're rich versus if you're poor. Um, in, in particularism, the rules get bent for people depending on who they are. So n everyone does not get treated equally. They get treated according to who they are. Another interesting cultural values continuum is uh, neutral versus effect affective, sorry, not effective. Neutral versus effective captures how acceptable it is within a culture to display emotion publicly. And uh, this one might make you laugh because this one is actually fairly noticeable if you just kind of stop and kind of see what's going on around you. So in a neutral culture, when it comes to exhibiting emotion in public, um, basically it's a no. You don't exhibit emotion in public in any strong form. So it's very hard to guess what people in a neutral culture are thinking or feeling because they don't show any uh, emotion on their faces or through their body language. Okay, They, they kind of have the same facial expression all the time. In an effective culture, it's actually very acceptable to demonstrate emotion and often quite strong emotion in public. So these are cultures in which you'll see people basically wearing their emotions on their sleeves. They'll have grand gestures. They'll have very animated facial expressions. They might laugh loudly. They'll cry dramatically. Um, all because within these cultural, these cultures, it's acceptable to demonstrate that type of emotion. So we've got our neutral versus effective cultures here.
And it's always kind of fun because people who come from affective cultures and look at, an, at a neutral culture, they just think people are really boring and they really have no idea what people are thinking. People going from a neutral culture into an affective culture, they just think people are either very dramatic or they think people are seriously going seriously angry with each other or going to kill each other because these these crazy um exaggerated large emotions are being demonstrated so it's really quite entertaining to see people from the two opposite sides of this continuum try to get their heads around the other groups the final values continuum um we'll look at is called achieve status versus ascribe status so achieve status means that I get status within my culture or my society uh, based on my based on merit. So I've worked hard, I'm very smart, I'm well educated, I work long hours, I take risk, you know, my status, I've worked for it. On the other hand, we have a scribe status, and that is um, where a culture gives status or power to people based on who they are. So what's their family name? Are they beautiful? Um, characteristics like that that they inherited basically so ascribe status gives status accorded according to inheritance whereas achieve status gives status accord, according to merit okay there are many more values continuums out there if you want to do more research on these look at the work of Geert Hofstede and you'll see lots of work from him and then you'll also see a lot of other people have kind of picked up on his ideas but the cultural values continuums are really important for us um, to, as a tool for analyzing that core piece of a culture so that we can really understand at the ideas and values level how a culture is unique. Another framework that's useful for understanding culture is called the learning domains of culture. The learning domains of culture kind of steals from the work of um, Bloom. So Benjamin Bloom, I don't know if you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, which kind of ranks um, different learning tasks in order of complexity. Um, he's also famous for the learning domains, which looks at the three big categories or areas in which we have to learn something in order to actually say that we know that. And we can apply Bloom's learning domains to culture. So we can say that we really only know a culture if we can understand it at the cognitive level. So we have the knowledge of it. So we know all about um, intellectually and academically, we know all that information about that culture. And then we can only know it if we then add the effective piece in which we understand it at an emotional level and we can manage that culture at an emotional level. And then if we understand it at the behavioral level, so we know the different behaviors um, that go along with that culture. So the, the learning domains of culture are really important from my perspective because, because of that effective piece. So we've already seen the cognitive piece in terms of, you know, the knowledge about the, the tourist pieces of a culture and the products and, the and, and so on. And then we've seen the behavioral piece uh, with that behaviors level in our onion analogy. But what learn the learning domains of culture brings to our understanding of culture is that effective piece in that we really have to manage our emotions when we're interacting with a different culture. Interacting across cultures is very challenging emotionally because um, interacting with a culture kind of destabilizes us at the identity level. We're not really certain of anything. Everything's very different. It's very frustrating um, and we can get very angry. Um, we can get the opposite. We can get very excited. So there's this whole emotional piece that comes with interacting with another culture and learning another culture. And that's what this learning domains of culture is really good for. It allows us to acknowledge that there is a very powerful, effective piece when it comes to learning new cultures and interacting with new cultures. The acculturation model is a good model to look at because with this model we're looking at what an individual experiences when he or she encounters or tries to integrate into another cultural group or another culture. So the acculturation model takes culture down to the very individual level. What do we experience as individuals when we go into a new culture? There are different acculturation models out there. The one I've selected has five steps. There are others with six steps, others with four steps, and so on. But all of these acculturation models look at the same thing. What is the individual experience of going into another culture? 
So let's look at this five-step model. So the first step in this model is ethnocentrism. And this is where we're at when we've never encountered another culture. We've all, we only know our culture. And so the very first time that we step outside of our culture, um, we kind of we think we go in with a mindset our culture is the best. Everything that our culture does is right. Anything outside of that is wrong. So we're very inwardly focused when it comes to our culture because that's all we know. We don't know anything else. Then the next step is excitement. So we we've been enclosed in our own cultural bubble and then we step outside of that and we see everything that's different and we're like, wow, this is really cool. There's all this different stuff out here. People are wearing different clothing, they're eating different things, they're speaking a different language. This is cool, this is interesting. However, then reality sets in and we get this wonderful thing that you've probably heard about called culture shock. Culture shock is the emotional boomerang that we experience when we go in, when we get over that excitement stage or the honeymoon stage. So culture shock is an emotional reaction to having to manage all of that difference. So we, we, when we hit everything that's different, we start getting frustrated because we can't even do the simplest thing in this new culture. We can't go to the bank and, and use an ATM. We can't go to a post office to mail something. Uh, we can't order food in a restaurant. Um, people aren't, you know, walking on the right side of the street. So everything that we take for granted on a daily basis within our own culture is now different. And so we start to feel very incompetent because we can't do even the simplest things. Even the most basic assumption we have gets challenged by the new culture. So interacting with this new culture just sends emotional reverberations right through us, which result in things like frustration, anger, it can turn into depression, um, it can just turn into a lot of negative emotion. There's a lot of research been done on culture shock, and a lot of it focuses on the fact that encountering a new culture really challenges us at the identity level. So it's not just that the food is different, but it, it challenges everything that we believe about the world and everything that we believe about ourselves. So it, it kind of shakes the foundation underneath our identity, which is why culture shock is very real and it is very stressful. It's like our identity is, is being attacked by this new culture because everything is so different and everything we believe and everything we think is being challenged. The next step is recovery. And so after going through this quite traumatic challenge of everything that we believe in and feeling very incompetent because we can't do anything in this new culture, we start to figure things out. And kind of two things happen. First of all, on a daily basis, we learn how to do things again. So we learn which side of the street we need to walk on or drive on. We learn how to mail something at the post office. We learn how to get money out of the bank. So we start to feel competent again because these daily tasks that we could do automatically in our own culture, they're starting to become automatic. But another thing is also happening. We're also building a second identity. So we're building an identity that can function within that new culture. So our previous identity allowed us to function effectively in our own culture. In the recovery stage, we start to build a second identity or a third, however many cultures we've interacted with, that then allows us to be emotionally stable and confident within that new culture. So two things happen in that recovery stage. We just figure out how to function in the culture, and then we start to build that new cultural identity for ourselves. Then finally, we arrive at the last step, and there's kind of three options we have at this last step. The first option is assimilation. In this option, we decide to completely discard our previous cultural identity and completely embrace our new cultural identity. So we let go who we previously were, and now we embrace this new person that's associated with this new culture. We try to be as similar and as identical as possible to people in our new culture. Another option we have is adaptation. In, in, in adaptation, we don't entirely let go of our first cultural identity. Um, we keep that as part of us, but then we layer on this second identity that allows us to be successful in our new cultural environment. Or the third option is departure. We might decide that this new culture simply is not going to work for us, and so we're going to leave because it just is not a good fit, so we're going to go back to our original culture. So those are the three possible outcomes with this acculturation model.
Once again, this model is really helpful because it allows us to dig down at the individual level to find out what happens when we integrate with or encounter a new culture. Communicative competence is actually a model for language and for language acquisition uh, when you're learning a second, third, or fourth language. But communicative competence is also a really good model for culture because it's a model that allows us to start to see the relationship between culture and language. And we are getting more complex here with our frameworks. So communicative competence as a term has been around for about 50 years, but it's been um, re redefined or re-envisioned over time. So the model we're going to look at here is, is the most recent envisioning of communicative competence. So communicative competence is your ability to communi communicate effectively in a language that you're learning. And so there's a number of variables involved in your overall ability to communicate effectively. So these are, um, we're going to start on the, the left with linguistic competence. So the most obvious competence is your understanding of the language and your ability to use the language. So um, do you know its grammar? Do you know its vocabulary? Do you know the word order to put things in, its syntax? Um, do you know its phonology and so on? So linguistic competence is your basic ability to use the tools of a language, its grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, and so on. Then add to that sociocultural competence. This is your ability to select appropriate um, communication for the particular cultural context or social context in which you are interacting. So do you say the right thing at the right time given the people you're communicating with and given the relationships and the situation? That's sociocultural competence. Then we have formulaic competence. Formulaic competence is, is the newest addition to this model, actually. And formulaic competence is your knowledge and ability to use set phrases in a language um, that are used at certain points in time. And formulaic language allows us to be very efficient, but also very natural in our communication. So for example, a piece of formulaic language in English is, hi, how are you? So whenever you meet someone, you say, hi, how are you? Or hi, how is it going? This is a formula that you use when you're greeting someone. We have formulas in language for everything, for greetings, for saying goodbye, for getting money out of the bank, for going to the post office, for ordering in a restaurant, and so on. There's all sorts of formulaic language out there. So being able to use formulaic language accurately and appropriately really makes your communication much more efficient and effective. Then there's interactional competence. This is your ability to manage the back and forth part of communication. So um, another word for this is turn taking. So do you know when it's your turn to speak? Do you take your turn when it's when it's your turn to speak? Or do you interrupt people? Do you intentionally interrupt them or accidentally interrupt them? How do you manage those interactions with people in that language? Then in the middle, we have discourse competence. This is your understanding and ability to use big picture uh, communication. Discourse is beyond the sentence level. So discourse is how we structure our communication given a particular situation. So an example of discourse competence would be your understanding of how the entire communication of a greeting would, would progress. So, um, a greeting for someone we know, for example, would go, hi, how's it going? Oh, it's going well. How about you? Um, what's new? Oh, nothing much. Um, how about you? What's new with you? So the speakers both understand this whole series of questions and answers that they're going to go through in order to communicate. And this entire set is called discourse competence. Finally, there's strategic competence. Strategic competence allows us to use different non-linguistic strategies in order to communicate. So, for example, if I can't think of a particular vocabulary word, a strategy I might use is to point to something or to draw it or to gesture. This is me demonstrating strategic competence. I'm doing whatever it takes in order to communicate effectively. So where does culture come into this? Well, obviously it comes in at this sociocultural competence level. So I need to understand my culture uh, in order to appropriate, appropriately select how I'm going to communicate to someone, what I'm going to say, and so on. So communicative competence integrates this, this allowance for culture in the whole language piece. So it resides in that sociocultural competence piece.
So communicative competence is a really good starting point for this integration of language and culture and really exploring how these two relate and how we use language when we're integrating with a new culture. Just as we have communicative competence, we can also have intercultural competence. And this is your ability above and beyond language to interact effectively across cultures. So how effective are you when you're inter interacting with someone from another culture? So this, this model for intercultural competence is all based around the French word savoir, which is to know or to have the ability to do. So there are five different types of savoir to the intercultural competence model. So the first one is pure savoir, pure knowing. On the left, the savoirs, which is knowledge of self and knowledge of other, um, knowledge of how to interact with individuals and society. So this is your basic academic knowledge, so to speak, and knowledge of self and knowledge of other. Then we have savoir être, and this means your attitude. So this kind of pulls from that affective domain in the learning domains of culture. So your attitudes towards self and, and the value you place on others. Then we have savoir s'engager, which is very similar to the interactive competence or interactional competence in the previous model. This is basically, do you know how to interact and engage uh, with that culture um, at the education level, at the political level, at the cultural awareness level? Then we have savoir apprendre or savoir faire, which means do you have the skills to interact effectively with that culture, to discover it or to interact with people from that culture? So savoir faire is very much the behavior level that we saw in the learning domains um, and in other models. So this is the skill level. And finally, we have savoir comprendre, which means do you have the skills to interpret what's going on? So you don't just take your intercultural um, communication or interaction at the surface level, but you have the skills to really dig deeply and figure out what exactly is going on. So you're not jumping to conclusions or making assumptions. You're using all your cultural knowledge and all your cultural skills to figure out what's going on in this cross-cultural or intercultural um, interaction. So intercultural competence is a, a really useful model to start to just isolate what happens or what do we need in order to effectively interact across cultures above and beyond language. We can take our two previous models and put them together. So we can take communicative competence, which is our ability to communicate across languages, and our intercultural competence, which is our ability to be effective interacting cross-culturally, and we can get intercultural communicative competence. So putting the two models together gives us intercultural communicative competence. So this is an individual who is both competent at the communication side of things and the intercultural side of things. So we take all the elements of our communicative competence, so linguistic competence, sociocultural competence, and so on, and then we put it together with our intercultural competence. This gives us an individual who is both effectively from a communication perspective and from a cross-cultural perspective. So this is, this is a model that's getting much more complex, and it's really letting us understand the complexity involved in being effective in cross-cultural communication scenarios. So it is complex, but it's also very useful because we can start to see the complex interaction of language and culture when it comes down to being effective in cross-cultural situations. We've been working from simpler frameworks for culture up to the more complex frameworks for culture, and now we've come to the most complex framework. And this is a framework called dynamic systems theory. Dynamic systems theory comes to us from the hard sciences and mathematics. And in the hard sciences and mathematics, dynamic systems theory um, looks at computational models to try to figure out how multiple variables within a system are going to interact to create a specific outcome or a specific endpoint. And the idea behind this is that everything is a system. And within that system, there are all these variables that mutually influence each other to give us certain outcomes. But it's quite unpredictable because we don't quite know what that mutually influencing power is going to look like. And so it, it might look random and very unpredictable, but we do know that all of this interaction is going on. So we use the word dynamic because the system is constantly changing. 
and it's constantly changing as a result of those different interactions. So dynamic is an important word, unpredictable is an important word, complex is an important word. All of these are important when it comes to dynamic systems theory. The, the easiest way to understand dynamic systems theory is to look at the weather. Meteorologists often get mocked because they can't predict what the weather on a specific point, a specific day is going to be or at a specific point in time. So they can have a big global picture, but when it comes down to how all of these different factors are going to interact at a specific point in time, it's much, much harder to predict because you don't know exactly which variables are going to have more influence or less influence at a specific point in time. So that's the essence of dynamic systems theory as using a weather analogy. As I said, it started out in the hard sciences and, and mathematics, and then it moved, carried over into the behavioral sciences. It's carried over into medicine, so a lot of researchers are now looking at um, illness from a dynamic systems perspective. It's carried over into the biological sciences for the same reason. And it's now starting to come over into the social sciences. And the reason for this is that we're starting to understand just how complex all of these concepts are that we deal with in the social sciences. And culture is one of them. Diane Larson Freeman was one of the first people to put forward the idea of dynamic systems theory as, a, as applied to language and language acquisition. So back in 1997, um, she put out a, a position paper um, indicating that we really needed to look at language as a dynamic system, at language learners as dynamic systems, and so on. And I propose that we can do the same thing with culture. So we can look at a culture as a dynamic system, um, which results from the interaction of multiple variables, and it's an unpredictable interaction, it's a dynamic interaction. We can also look at an individual undergoing a cross-cultural experience as a dynamic system. So we don't know exactly how that individual is going to react to the culture at a given point in time, given this whole mix of variables that are interacting to create that outcome. So dynamic systems theory is, is really powerful for an application to culture because it allows us to focus on complexity. Um, our simple frameworks make culture seem very simple and very manageable, but we know that it's not. We know that culture, cross-cultural interactions, and culture learning, these are all really complex things. And so we need a theory or a framework that allows us just to acknowledge, you know what, this is complex. We can't use dynamic systems theory to really pull apart quantitatively what's going on when it comes to culture because that would take very complex computational models, um, which are far beyond my capability and beyond the capability of most social researchers. Um, but it's very powerful because it just lets us say that at the end of the day, culture is really, really complex. Learning a new culture is also very complex. And here are the variables involved in creating that complexity. And it allows us just to sort of let ourselves off the hook when it comes to the challenges of functioning cross-culturally and understanding another culture. Because, you know, we, we look at culture and if we just use a tourist definition, we think, you know what, it's really simple. Why can't I get my head around this? Or why can't I deal with this? But it's not really simple. It's very, very complex. And there's just a lot going on for us to manage and to learn and to understand. So at a very fundamental level, dynamic systems theory lets us acknowledge that, you know what, we're dealing with a really, really complex entity here. So we need to just acknowledge that complexity. So that's dynamic systems theory. Here's a quick review of the different cultural frameworks that we've looked at. So we've, we've started from the simpler frameworks and moved towards the more complex frameworks. So on the simple end, we've got the tourist definition, and then we've got the iceberg analogy and the onion analogy. Getting a little bit more complex, we've got cultural values continuums. Then we've got the learning domains of culture. And then we've looked at models of competence. So we've got communicative competence, which fo focuses on our ability to use language, a different language other than our first one. We've got intercultural competence, which is our ability to function within another culture effectively. And then we've got intercultural communicative competence, which puts those two together. And then finally, we've got dynamic systems theory, which simply acknowledges that culture itself is a very complex entity with multiple variables interacting to create any outcome at any given point in time. So that, those are the cultural frameworks that we've looked at. 
You can listen to the lecture as many times as you need to in order to understand the cultural frameworks. And I apologize if at times I started to speak fairly quickly. I tend to do that, unfortunately, when I'm lecturing. Once you've sufficiently understood the concepts presented in the lecture, follow the written instructions I've provided for recording your responses to the lecture in VoiceThread and for recording your responses to your fellow participants. So this is what we call an asynchronous discussion. So I'm providing you with a tool, VoiceThreads, with which to have an asynchronous discussion with your fellow participants in response to the information presented in the lecture. So thanks very much for hanging in there and listening, and I look forward to listening to your responses to the lecture and to your fellow participants.